What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? Don't ever wait for your doctor to order blood tests. With Private MD Labs, you can get your blood test prescription online in under one minute and go directly to over 4,000 lab locations in the United States. They offer every blood test imaginable at affordable prices with highly accurate results from tried and true state-of-the-art blood testing diagnostics. In fact, I've been using Private MD Labs for more than a decade. Their blood tests are much more in-depth and accurate than any at-home pinprick or worthless saliva test. Skip the intrusive doctor questions and get the exact tests that I recommend. Be proactive and get your panels today. Go to privatemdlabs.com forward slash JC to take 15% off your order. Send you guys love and light. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? It's Jay Campbell and you of course are watching the Jay Campbell podcast and I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio by an amazing woman by the name of Dr. Sandra Kaufman. She actually wants me to call her Dr. Sandy on the show. Dr. Sandy, how are you? I am great. Thanks so much, Jay Campbell. It's so awesome to have you here today. Uh, So I actually already admitted it full, full, forcibly and transparently that I think that I have whatever this is uh, on the last podcast I did earlier today, but I am making it through the show and making it through today. I have manifested this as my reality. So uh, she is actually going to talk about probably a little bit about this in the podcast because she has an amazing bio, which I will tell you guys right now. She's the founder of the Kaufman anti-aging Institute. So yes, that's why she's on the Jay Campbell podcast, a forward thinking educational company with the overarching goal of educating the general public on why we age and how we can minimize the effects of aging to live longer, healthier lives. The Kaufman Protocol, which has been a book, uh, is a product of and underpinned Sanders' longevity and cellular biology expertise. Notice how I left out what I needed to leave out there. Dr. Kaufman has a master's degree from the University of Connecticut in tropical ecology and plant physiology. Plants are conscious, by the way. She is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board and has recently received an accolade from the American Health Council as best in medicine. And she's a certified expert on the science of medicine and specifically anti-aging. And that's why she's here on the Jay Campbell podcast today. So as I have been asking a lot of the people in the last two or three months, um, you know, at the beginning of the show, before we get into the meat and potatoes, the world is in a very tumultuous place. (laughs) For lack of a better definition, we are now, uh, for a timestamp, today is Thursday, January 20th, uh, 2022. Dr. Sandy, what do you, what is your take on where the planet is going? You know, are we headed to a dystopian world? Or are we creating the golden age? Oh, my God. That is the broadest question I have ever heard in my life. That's why you're on the Jay Campbell podcast. Are we talking epidemiology and the onset of like uh, the zombie apocalypse? (laughs) Are we talking like global melting? It's up to your interpretation. Well, I was I was an environmentalist, so we can talk about like death of the rainforest. Uh, One of my hobbies is climbing big old mountains and you see sort of the horrible things going off the top of mountains. So we could talk about that. I'm a diehard environmentalist, um, but my goal is to live longer, to see all of this through and, you know, just to have a, a nice, joyous, healthy life. Well, what do you, but what do you think though? I mean, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. I mean, is humanity like, are we past our sell by date at this point? Oh my God. That is such a loaded question. Um, I will tell you, so from an, uh, an evolutionary point of view, right? right we're organisms. Organisms yep. face challenges. Yep. And we have basically destroyed any <laughs> environmental ability to control the human population, right? So wait a minute, you mean that two million pound blob of floating plastic in the Pacific is not natural? Shockingly enough. Well, depends how you define natural, right? 
it came from elements that were on this planet that we just sort of synthesized and reorganized. So at some point we'll figure out how to get rid of that. We will. Some very smart people are working on that. I think that's going to go away. My concern is as human evolution, because yeah. once upon a time, there were enough pathogens that had kept the human population in check. And there was this thing called survival of the fittest. And, you know, the people that weren't surviving sort of their genes got knocked out and other right. people survived. Right. And my favorite, of course, is the Black Death, which sounds horribly pathetic, right? The Black Death. But 60% of Europe died. But the cool thing about that is that 40% lived. So if, if you are of European descent, uh, I am, some other, obviously not everyone is, but if you are, it no, means that your ancestors survived the Black Plague, right. Right? right? If you're anywhere else in the world, you survived the Spanish flu. So here we are now, 100 years later, and it's the onset of COVID. So it's just another hurdle that humanity right. is going to get by. And you either survive it or you don't, based on your genetics, your lifestyle, your choices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And granted, no one likes to see like all of these people die or suffer. But the reality is, is this is the way human evolution works. Right. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea and that thought process into looking at it as an evolutionary uh, scientist. Because you're right. I mean, we all have a limited time, time span. You know, th this is the fourth turning too, right? Like we are now at a hundred year cycle of change. And, you know, on top, because again, a hundred years ago was the Spanish flu. People don't yep. really put two and two together. Right. And it seems like, you know, uh, this is just a time now for the, uh, the, the DNA of humanity to make it or break it. You, you either, you either adapt and pivot and survive and advance or you don't, you know? And so I think that's kind of where we are, um, to, you know, right now, planetary wide, although I, you know, and I don't want to go into this. I think it is, th there is a debate to be had about like certain countries and nations right now, like with their draconian lockdown measures versus, I mean, we're blessed obviously that we're still in the United States and we have relative freedom and you're in Florida. Oh, we have, we have absolute freedom. The, the Absolutely. freest of states, Fantastic. right? And I'm in California, commie California, whatever this is, right? Now, I live in a red county. I always tell people, you know, if you're going to live in the United States now, make sure you have a sheriff, uh, I'm sorry, a county that is upholds constitutional law, right? Because if you have a sheriff that upholds the constitutional law, the governments cannot screw with you. Uh, and that's where I live in Riverside County. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Okay, so we'll talk about the stuff that I want to talk about, which is why you're on the show. <laughs> Uh, and that is, um, why do we age is the first point. Okay. Why do we age? Well, you could come up with a million uh, answers depending on who you ask. You're asking a cell biologist and a physician and a expert in anesthesia. So <laughs> I... No, I am. This is a hobby. You could put me under better than most people could. No, actually, I don't because I do pediatrics. I'm actually, you don't know this. I, so I'm actually the chief of pediatric anesthesia for a very large hospital and health company. That's um, awesome. This whole longevity thing is simply a hobby to keep me entertained because I get bored very easily. Very um, cool. But you age in my world because your cells age. Right. And you are composed of cells and cell products and cells age in very, very specific reasons. Uh, for the most part, we know what these reasons are. And if you block uh, those reasons individually to a certain degree, then synergistically you reduce relative risk of aging and relative risk of disease onset. Very few words. <laughs> you're like, oh, geez. So, I mean, but, I mean, so you're basically saying that we age, you know, due to the lifestyle, the choices that we make. And no, that, that's not that's what I'm saying at all. No, no, no. I'm saying if you took a cell out of your body and put it under a microscope, you could actually look at your cell aging. Right. So right? you're saying well, aging is inevitability, but you're not saying that our life. So what are you saying then? You're saying that lifestyle doesn't enhance aging or, of course it or does. accelerate no. aging? No, no, no. No, of course it does. So we know, number one, that you have DNA, just as, as one of the examples and one of the tenets of aging, of which there are seven, your DNA has errors in it every day. Just by itself, there are 10 to the fifth DNA errors per cell per day in your body, okay? But if you expose that to a rough environment, meaning bad diet, pollution, chemicals, all that sort of thing, the number of DNA errors goes up. 
So you're taking a bad situation and making it way worse by having a not so great lifestyle. Got it. Uh, the key to what I do is we take things that reduce DNA damage and increase the rate of repairing your DNA. Understand. Understand. Right. And if you do it in all seven tenants, you reduce relative risk. That is on top of having a decent diet and decent exercise patterns and, and that sort of thing. So the seven steps or the seven things that's in the longevity protocol. Right. Addressing it. Right. So what I did is number one, I decided, so Aubrey de Grey has the nine hallmarks of aging, which seemed kind of absurd when I looked at it. I decided that you age for seven reasons because no one can remember anything more than seven, right? Which is why we have seven digit phone numbers. Um, and then I looked at every molecular agent that was available at the time. My first book came out two and a half years ago. My second book is sitting on my editor's desk right now. So there'll be 48 plus or minus agents rated right now. But I looked at what each agent did on a cellular basis, real research, um, and then I rated them. So every agent now comes with a seven digit rating number and each number reflects how effective it is in each of the seven categories of aging. So in my world, everything comes with like a barcode and then to create a longevity uh, program for any one individual, you sort of maximize these point scores. So longevity sort of becomes a mathematical algorithm in my world. Makes sense. Health span versus lifespan. I mean, uh, you're familiar with the company True Diagnostic? Sure. Yeah, Ryan Smith and those guys. Um, talk a little bit about health span versus lifespan. I mean, I, I have a good, uh, what I think to be a decent understanding, but can you maybe explain it for the audience? Absolutely. So it, this is a very, very, very simple concept. Because when you talk about longevity, it freaks people out because they don't want to be 110 in a wheelchair, trait. Right with no mental capacity. And that, that is some people's idea. Take the 40 big pharma drugs a day too. Don't forget right. that. I mean, that's just miserable. Who would want to do that, right? So there's a difference between how long you live and how well you live, right? So your health span is how long are you healthy? And that's really the goal of all of this. If you can reduce relative risk of disease, you by definition increase your health span. But by extension, by increasing your health span, you are increasing your lifespan. Right. So personally, I think I'm going to be like 120. I'll be rock climbing, screw up a knot and fall off a cliff. And I'm like, you know what? That was the best life ever. Right. And I'll be fine with that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the purpose. I mean, you know, I know we're talking what we're talking about right now, but I mean, the purpose of life is joy. Yes. And to experience the experience of living. So many people are focused on doing, 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 and they're not focused on being. Right. Well, the and, point of this is to make your being better. Yeah. Right. Right. But you also have to appreciate the being, you know, it's like too many people are caught up in the doing of, you know, anti-aging or whatever you want to call this age management, you know, living longer and stronger. Um, and, but still not embracing that moment, you know, the precious present of like, while you're doing it, because it really is the experience of, the things that you're doing that's the purpose and or, or, or what is really valuable well you know? i think it's different for different people some people you're right that these hackers are obsessed obsessed right my goal is to figure out what my program is going to be do it without thinking about it yeah. and then it just gives me the leeway to do whatever the hell i want to do at the right. same time i'm horribly academically entertained by discovering new stuff i get so excited when i'm like yeah combing through like geeky literature and I find some new concept like, oh my God, that's amazing. This is kind of life shattering. Um, I just find that amazing. But that I guess is truly is part of the joy of life as well. Yeah. No, I mean, being, being is enjoying what you're doing. It's literally losing yourself in the discovery of the things that excite you. Yes. Right. So for yeah. you to read new stuff, geek out, you know, I have my own things, but like that, we have to do what brings us joy as much as possible and live in that moment. Uh, the other one is another point you have is aging versus disease. Right. So what happens is as you get older and your cells fail, specific areas of cell failure bring on diseases. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, you know what? It would actually help. Let me run through the seven tenets really yeah, quickly. I was, yeah, I was going to ask you what that. I'm talking about. Yeah. Kind of like Let's talking around the box, but not actually opening the box. Yeah. 
Um, so, so tenet one has to do with DNA problems. It's DNA alterations. So it's telomere shortening. And every time your cells replicate or they get stressed out, your telomeres shorten. And that's uh, directly proportional to the length of your life. And then there's epigenetic modification. And that has to do with what types of proteins and such you make as you get older. And the crappier the environment that you are in, the worse modifications you get. And the good news is you can sort of reverse that. And then the last thing in that category is how to protect your DNA from various insults. And we can do that. So that's kind of cool. Tenet two has to do with mitochondria. Some people right. are convinced that this is the end all be all of longevity, but it's in my world, it's a piece, right? Mitochondrial fail for very specific reasons. You have a nicotinamide deficiency. You have deficiency of uh, endogenous free radical scavengers. You also have uh, coenzyme Q deficiency. You have, you know, it, there, there's a plethora of things that go on in your mitochondria. My favorite new one that I just discovered is called the uh, mitochondrial permeability transition pore. And as you get older, the pore opens more and it sort of blows up your mitochondria. But we can close that, which is kind of cool. Anyway, so there are many things. How, how do you do. close that? So there's a bunch of agents. It's, it's really, it's wackadoodle. Um, it's kind of like this pop-off valve in your mitochondria. And it, it flickers to just sort of let some of the high pressure out. Pressure meaning uh, chemical gradients. Yeah. Um, but as you get older, it just sort of stays open. And the problem with that is a whole lot of stuff from your cytosol and your mitochondria get released first in the cytosol of the whole cell. And then it sort of blows up the cell and the whole thing becomes apoptotic. So interestingly enough, there are a few agents that can decrease this. So spermidine can do it, metformin can do it, uh, fisetin can do it. There's a variety of things and they, and they work in different pathways. Um, but just yeah. by stabilizing your pore, it's been demonstrated that if you have mark, uh, if you have um, coronary disease and you're having an infarct, if you stabilize your pores, you're more likely not to die. So we know it works in real people. So that's kind of cool. Very cool. Okay, keep going. Sorry. So that's all right. So that's mitochondria. Third one is what I call pathways, and this is your AMP kinase pathway, right. which is your two ends, and then your mTOR pathway. Um, Everyone loves to uh, this, have this caloric restriction diet, which activates your AMP kinase pathway. It's been shown to you know help you a lot. Uh, you have seven mammalian sirtuins. They control like what you make over time. They kind of fail. You have to fix that. Um, and this goes actually going back to the AMP kinase pathway. This goes back to like enjoying your life. Right. Everyone is obsessed about how long they can fast. Right. I'm the world's worst faster. I go back to enjoying my donuts every day. Um, I just can't stand fasting. So I take agents that mimic fasting so that I, you know, so I'm on a bunch of AMP kinase activators. So it does exactly the same thing. Um, you know, the purists are going to say you're cheating. And the answer is I absolutely am cheating because yeah, but if you can, you can, but what, so what are your, what are the mimetics that you use? So there's a whole lot of them. So ECGC does it again, metformin and berberine do it. Um, are you a supporter of using berberin and metformin concomitantly? I am. And the reason I, there is a study. Originally I was an absolute. Oh, there's a study. There's a study. I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't live by anecdotal evidence. This is study based. Right? I told you I was a geek. Um, no, because so metformin is, is, does like an amazing set of things as of does course. birth What's amazing is I expected the molecules to look the same and they don't, they're completely and utterly different, but they do a lot of the same stuff, but not completely the same stuff. So there was a study and they demonstrated if you take, Instead of all of one or all of the other, if you take half and half, you just do significantly better. So I'm like, well, there it is. That's the answer. Okay. So how are you using it? Are you using dihydroberberin? Um, uh, you know what? I think so. It's, it's one of the high bioavailabilities. I yeah. sort of rotate brands, to be perfectly honest, to sort of see what they're going to do. Well, it's if you listen to Sean Wells, you got to use dihydroberberin, dude. I know you know Sean, don't you? I think you know Sean. Uh, right? I know the name. I've never met him. Yeah. Have you, you've met my friend Ben Azadi. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So how do you use metformin and, ber and, and, and berberin together in dosages? Like how do you split it up? So I do 500 of berberine in the morning and 500 of metformin at night. Love that. Uh, and the reason I skip the afternoon is because that's generally when I'm exercising. Right, right, right. Because, right. You know, I go to work and, and I want to not block my mTOR pathway yep. as yep. I'm exercising. Yep. Um, and because I, so there's a huge war, and I'm sure you know this about the mTOR pathway. Yeah. And I have to you say, can't I can't use metformin because it prevents mTOR signaling. Well, what's, what's really <laughs> interesting, right? I mean, there's there's wars because there's, you know, and, and I have to tell you, so I looked at your website and you and your wife are very muscular and very buff. Uh, the problem with 
the mTOR pathway by blocking it is you don't get the big giant muscles, which is fine theoretically, uh, but you don't want to be, you know, by blocking it entirely, you're going to be turn out to be frail. And these yeah. people that like are huge rapamycin proponents, if you look at them, they are not fit at all. No. Hey guys, what's going on? If you're looking to level up your life from a mind, body, and spiritual perspective, join the fully optimized health private membership group today. There is no better place online to discuss hormones, peptides, fitness, fat loss, supplements, and even raising your consciousness with an elite tribe of men and women. You also get to speak to me directly every single week in the Ask Me Anything. Join today. Go to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up and I'll see and talk to you soon. Well, so, I was just going to ask you about that. So, um, I mean, a hormonal optimization, I mean, we're getting into a lot of different topics here all of a sudden, but, um, but, but back to the memetics before, and we'll keep going. And I know you're only on phase three or four right now. Um, this is all great stuff, by the way. This is okay. really good information. A lot of people come on my podcast and it's my fault. I don't like get into the weeds with them and their expertise. And now I'm doing that with you. Cause I know that you're going to provide a lot of value here. I mean, this is like a really awesome gold podcast, but, um, Besides metformin and berberin, what other memetics are you using during the course of the day? Oh my God. So I take 52 agents a day. Wow. Yeah. Now, are you, are any of these you've created yourself? <laughs> so, well, so the answer is yes and no. I, I, so most of these things come from thousands of years of someone using them in some piece of the world somewhere. Sure. Right. right. And I, come through the Ar Ayurvedic literature, the Sanskrit, you know, not that I can read or write that, but you know, that's awesome. Right. Clearly I can read ancient Chinese. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita, yeah. anyone? <laughs> exactly. That's an amazing but, book. But I went through all these and when I, I travel a lot and every culture has their thing that they like, right? I was in Argentina climbing um, Aconcagua and I ran into the Makai berry, which has delphinid in it. I'm like, oh my God, this stuff rocks, that's right? so cool. Astaxanthin, Hawaii and Japan, it's amazing. Uh, Japan what is, is your dosage of astanthin. I can't even ever pronounce that word. That's in my book, by the way, in 2017, in Agents of Change, we have a whole chapter, or not a chapter, but a section on astanthin. astaxanthin. So, so there's a chapter of astaxanthin in, in my book one. It's amazing stuff. And I it think is amazing stuff. The dose depends on who you are, how old you are, and what you want to accomplish. Yeah. So if you are a sit-at-home person, you're 40 years old. You're There's nobody like that that listens to this podcast. Yeah, okay. So your population should take 12 milligrams a day. How about that? There we go. I mean, so if you're going to run a marathon in the sun or you live in Florida or you're athletic at all, you need 12 milligrams a day. Okay. All right. Now, is there any, before I let you go to the next level, is there anything else that you would like to mention that is a very powerful memetic that you're using daily? Oh my God. Well, so we'll just get to them as we get to them. All right, go. Um, Keep going. So that's that's pathways. Uh, four is quality control. So you need to improve your uh, DNA repair mechanisms. You need to improve your protein repair mechanisms. And I have autophagy in this category yep. um, because it's cellular recycling, which is kind of like checking your widgets. So I put it in this category. Uh, one of the coolest things to come out of late, of course, is spermidine. Mm -hmm. Um. It's fantastic. I mean, it's what do you get? Your, what do you get your spermidine? Like what, what, the, what brand? So I use primidine. Uh, and the reason I do that is I love the company, uh, Oxford Healthspan, uh, the owner of which is a wonderful woman named, uh, Leslie. And she and I have gotten to be friends over all of this and the quality of their product is just unbelievable. Do you believe in its, uh, merits on improving hair regrowth also? So I'm, it's funny you should ask that. So I'm also good friends with this guy named Faraz Khan, who is like the hair guru. And he tasked me with figuring out why, how to fix one's hair and how to make it not go gray. So the hair microcosm is similar to your entire body in terms of the stem cells and the migration and all that. So I'm working on that. So the answer is one of the aspects of cell regrowth is the ability to regrow or to deteriorize uh, in cataphase and then in anaphase regrow the hair follicle, which requires a ton of autophagy, which is why spermidine should by definition help. And they've found clinically that it does. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it. I, I, I've i heard it again, studies. I mean, I, you know, my company, we sell a hair regrowth product, uh, you know, which is peptides. It's, uh, you know, GHKCU at a very, you know, not, not clinical, but close. 
uh, grade and then also carbon 60 in a uh, grape, grape seed oil extract. And, you know, we've been, we've had the product on the market now for 18 months and we have dramatic regrowth from a lot of different right. people, especially for so, women. So as a, as a side note here, so the hair, hair is really, it, it truly is a microcosm of longevity. Exactly. You know, anytime you add back a little bit. So what you just said is you put resveratrol in a, in a full vein, essentially, right? So that's a sirtuin activator and a free radical scavenger. So you just knocked off two of the pathways. Yeah. It's going to help. Is yeah. it going to hit all seven? No. Should it? No. Maybe. That's yeah. what we're working on. But anyway, we'll get there when we get there. I, I'm, I'm still in the analysis phase of hair. Um, but anyway. Very cool. Uh, but I love spermidine. And one of the cool things about it is, number one, uh, it does an amazing job at autophagy, which is why it's famous. Two, it does close uh, your mitochondrial transition pore, which we talked about earlier. But here's a really kick-ass thing about it. It is the molecule is this long chain. It has nitrogens at both ends, but it's a long positively charged chain. And it loves to snuggle up to negatively charged DNA molecules. So there's a minor and a major groove on the DNA and they're negatively charged. You're like going, oh shit, I don't need to know this. Um, but it's positively charged. So what happens is uh, spermidine and spermine get into your nucleus and they cozy up to your DNA and they actually bubble wrap it. So it protects your DNA from damage, which is, I think, insanely cool. And one of the big things that we're going to need in an environment where our DNA breaks and we get increased risk of the cancer. You know, uh, by the way, I, oh, let me ask you this. <laughs> uh, well, hold on. I got to ask you this. Uh, I'm sorry. My wife just texted me and she's like 911 wanting me. Um, is cancer completely man-made? No. No. So cancer, so let's take a generic cell, any yeah. cell. Fifth grade biology cell has all the components. Um, as I said, every cell has 10 to the fifth DNA errors per cell per day. And this is single strand, double strand, whatever, you know. But your, your DNA repair mechanisms can usually fix most of it, not all of it. So yeah. over the course of time, your DNA starts failing, right? So as the cell recognizes cell DNA problems, it puts it in a state of quiescence uh, and it fixes itself. And it, if it fixes itself effectively, cell pops out, you're good to go. Uh, if it can't, right, uh, then it just commits cell death and that's apoptosis. Right. In the middle, it comes out and it becomes senescent. Right. And I, these are the grumpy old man cells that they just yep. sit there and exude horrible cytokines, et cetera, right? That's sort of like the pathways of DNA damage. Yeah. Now, the problem is that these cells, if they persist in having DNA damage prior to undergoing all of those things, uh, they, depending on where the DNA damage is, the cell can grow out of control, right? And there's a lot of mechanisms uh, to have your body sort of offset that DNA damage. So some immune cells can sort of uh, identify sort of fucked up cells, pardon my language, and, and get rid of them. But a lot of them escape that. Uh, so as you get older and all of your systems fail, the likelihood of cancer goes up for anyone under any circumstances. Now, if you have a bad uh, environment, bad climate, bad food, bad this, bad that, not only do the epigenetics change, but the insults on your DNA change and the risk of right. cancer goes up as well. Uh, additionally, if you have inherited a set of genes that is already corrupted, like having the, the bad BRCA genes, then your risk goes up exponentially because usually you need two genes to go down to get cancer. Not always, but usually. So risk is it's just multifactorial. And it, again, it's also depending on the organ. Some organs are more prone to cancer than others because of risk of things hitting it. Like skin cancer is very high because UV radiation hits our skin, but it doesn't really hit our spleen. Like no one's ever died of, well, maybe somebody, very few people have ever died of like spleen cancer. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's extremely multifactorial. And to answer your wife's question, it's not entirely man-made. Got it. Okay. Um, keep going. We're okay. on five now. Yeah. So, so number five, uh, this is the inflammatory pathway. It's actually the immune system that sort of goes awry. So when you are young, you have this fantastic immune system that protects you from everything. As you get older, three bad things happen. Uh, number one, the cells that are supposed to protect you get out of control, release a lot of cytokines, and these cause systemic inflammatory issues. Uh, that's bad because it makes everything hurt, number one. Uh, inflammatory issues cause more DNA damage, and they cause everything to sort of go awry. So we are all becoming more and more and more inflamed over the course of time. 
two, these cells also are more prone to cause cancer or to be cancerous. So you have a very big rise in leukemias and lymphomas because that's where these cells come from. And then lastly, you'll see that they don't act as well. And this is sort of uh, demonstrated by the fact that old people don't respond very well because they don't have the mechanisms in action to create the antibodies to the antigen that they've received. So it's sort of a bad three for over the course of time. So one of the things most people really need to take care of is uh, lowering their inflammatory rates. Always. I mean, we say it, but people take aspirin every now and then. That's just, that's just not going to cut it. So you need to pull out the big guns on this one. I mean, you know, other than metformin living a cleanse, a clean lifestyle. I mean, what else? I mean, we already <laughs> I, was gonna say, I take 50 perfect. agents a day. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'd like to see these. I mean, do you have these published in your book? So the book one, it's really interesting. So the, it, the first half of it is kind of depressing. It is all of the things that I am talking about in terms of the seven tenants and why you age. And it is insanely detailed. Right. Um, there's some really bad jokes in there to try to get people over the rough spots. But this is not like an easy, you know, pick it up, self-help me book. You got to really want to read this. Yeah, book. no, I'll read it. I'll, I'll definitely read it. I mean, it's a fascinating discussion. Um, but book two. So there was anyway. So the second half is 15 agents in it. And then the second book has 30 some more. Okay, I mean, good. So book two is more actionable, basically. Definitely more actionable. Well, and the thing is, you don't have to take them all. You need to know about them to choose which right. ones are best for you. Which apply to your lifestyle, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Um, so when is the second book coming? Or can you send me the PDF so I can just hack through it? I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you want to. So it would... Definitely. So so it's really, fun. so I wrote it and I edited it and I sent it to my formatter. And when he formatted it, everything got screwed up. So all of the pictures got moved and uh, the print face changed and all my superscripts changed. So this is what I'm, I've, I've spent all day doing this, re-superscripting everything known to mankind. So you're welcome to look at it. It's just going to look a little funny right now. So as soon as I get all of these corrected, it goes back to the, the, the people and then hopefully we publish. Awesome. So when did you publish the first book? Oh, I see it right now, 2018. Yep. So the first one is really funny. So I wrote this thing. And as I said, I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist. Right. I didn't know anyone in the longevity world. Not, not a damn soul. I went to a bunch of publishers and they're like, you don't have a degree in longevity. <laughs> there aren't yeah. any. Right? Exactly. There aren't any. And they're like, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm a chief of pediatric anesthesia. And I'm like, yeah, we don't care. Like, who cares? I'm like, all right, well... Uh, so I went to Amazon and I, and I published it on Amazon and bizarrely enough with zero advertising, it has just become this weird cult classic in the longevity world. Like people find it. It's awesome. People I just ordered it. Vengeance. Somebody told me to buy it a while ago. And I, you know, I've read so many books at so many times and I really mostly just read books about consciousness and stuff anymore, but, uh, I just ordered it. So I can't wait. Well, this, this will be mind numbing. Just gloss over. <laughs> With the stuff that's really important, I like make I write in bold. I'm like, all right, here's the take home message. No, but I'm I have a scientific mind, so I mean, all of your detailed stuff, uh, I will geek out on too. I'm like you, I I'm very into that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't have a, I have a minor in molecular biology, but you know, I I, I was never going to be a doctor. It wasn't who I was. I couldn't sit down and like be that focused for that long, but I'm, you know, all about being self-taught and I've been self-teaching myself for 25 years or 30 years now, whatever it is. But, uh, so no, I'm fascinated to read more about that book and I'll be obviously interested to see that book. So are we on six now or are we uh, on, so we're on six? So six sort of is a little different than the other categories because in the other categories, I pretend that all cells are the same. And this is the category that recognizes that all cells are not the same. Right. So it's, it's called individual cell requirements because a red cell needs something different than a liver cell versus a brain cell, right? Um, in this category as well, I have stem cells that have very specific uh, requirements and then senescent cells, which are the ones we want to sort of get rid of. Right. Right. So in this category, my absolute favorite thing that I tell people about is quercetin. Everyone should be on quercetin. It yep. should be in the drinking water as far as I'm concerned. Yep. Um, most of it comes from onions, which are kind of disgusting, but clearly you can buy a pill that doesn't taste like onions. Um, but it does several things that I think are amazing. Number one, in terms of the world of COVID, it blocks viral replication in your cells. So even if you get infected with this virus or several others, it's just not going to replicate. So it's not going to do anything. Um, another thing that it does is it blocks mass cell degranulation. So when you have allergies or asthma or something, your cells just release histamine. 
and it, it drives you nuts. And that's the itchiness and the, the, like the whole gambit of annoyance right. and allergies. So mast cells get stabilized by quercetin. So I gave this to a friend of mine who had nasty asthma for a decade. And he's like, oh my God, it's gone. So I know it works. Very um, cool. And then in the longevity world, there's only three things right now that we know of to get rid of senescent cells. Uh, there's fisetin, which is truly amazing too, quercetin, and then denacetab, which is a chemotherapy agent, which I've tried on several occasions. It's just really hard to get and quite expensive. So in terms of normal people getting rid of senescent cells, fisetin and quercetin are the way to go here. How do you spell fisetin? F-I-S-E-T-I-N. Oh, I, I've not heard of that. They're sort of molecular cousins. Fisetin is more in strawberries. Um, I mean, I think I've seen it sold as a supplement. I think Taylor made sells it in their oral like supplement company that they hide and not let people know that they're selling it as a supplement company. You know, everyone sells all of this stuff. It's just a matter of how bioavailable, you know, what's how many milligrams per whatever. You know, is, is it a good quality? Blah, 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 blah. So in, in your metformin and berberin, you're taking berberin in the morning and metformin at night, and you're taking uh, 12 mil milligrams of Astac. And I can't pronounce it. Berberin. Say that again <laughs> for me one more time. Astaxanthin. Astaxanthin. I think I'll yeah, be able to say that. nuts because it's not zeaxanthin. There's I several know. xanthins. So, so your spermidine and the physicin, what, what are the dosages and when do you take those? Uh, this, you know what? I don't actually remember the, the spermidine dose, but, uh, I take it at night because it, it helps with sleeping as well. Fisetin and, and quercetin are really interesting because they do other things as well. Um, so you want to take a small amount every day right. and then every month you want to take a ton of it, uh, for two days. And that's been demonstrated to get rid of the senescent cells. So yeah. I like to think of it as a, as a basal rate and then like a bolus spike. Yeah, I take quercetin. I'm just not taking fisetin. Do you know what the but dose you is? Just make sure, you know what? I don't remember offhand. And it also depends on whether or not it's bioavailable or not. Uh, I take a lot of stuff from Rev Genetics because it's in a nanomycel. Um, so the dose of that is going to be different. So depending on how they decide to make it bioavailable, the dose is not always the same. Okay, very cool. The other um, interesting thing is I never take as much as anyone ever tells me to take because when you take 50 agents a day, a lot of it is synergistic. Right. There's no evidence that more is necessarily better. It's kind of like in my world, eating a balanced diet every day. I just have a balanced diet of longevity supplements. But has more more of anything ever been better? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Go low. I'm sorry. Go slow. I'm sorry. Start low and go slow. That's kind of the way I always look at things. And you know, it, it, you know, be judicious, almost frugal. Well, but it also depends on like how old you are and where you are, right? Yeah. If you are, you know, 35, 40 and you're just starting this, the whole go slow, be frugal thing is reasonable. If yeah. you are 75, 80 and, and, right. and bad things are setting in, I say be aggressive. Yeah. Death yeah. is on, on the doorstep. Let, let's do what we can like now. Right. Yep. Agreed. Um, okay. Did you get to seven? No. So seven, you're going to love seven. Seven is waste management, right? So this falls into two categories. The easiest one is lipofusion accumulation, right? So whenever you have uh, autophagy and the cell recycles things, there's always a bit of junk left over that the cell yeah. can't metabolize. And the cell is very smart. It does exactly what the rest of us do is it shoves it in the back, right? I call this the kitchen drawer phenomenon. There's a drawer in everyone's kitchen where you shove the crap that you don't know what to do with. Right. We all have it because everyone always says, yeah, yeah, I do. So that's your lipofusion accumulation. And if you were to move from house to house, like you'd start with a new drawer every time. So it wouldn't be a big deal. But if you lived in the same house for a hundred years, that drawer is going to be pretty damn stuffed. And this is what happens to cells. So cells that turn over a lot don't have lipofusion accumulations. Cells that you have for your entire life do. So most importantly here are your brain cells. You have them for usually your entire life with the exception of some hippocampal turnover. And we can talk about that later, but the cells that stay there for your whole life, like they dissected a few really old people's brains, clearly after they were dead, and um, just stuffed with life effusion. And you just can't think when literally your brain is full of other crap. So that's a problem. And then the other huge thing in this category is glycation, right? Glucose, yeah. the big conversation. This is the other thing that people are like convinced. This is the end all be all of longevity, blah, blah, blah. Right. And the answer is it's a component. It's not the entirety. Right. So glucose, and I'll just say, you already know this, but I'll say it anyway. 
glucose is molecularly sticky. It right. sticks in your body to proteins, lipids, and DNA, causes the formation of AGEs, advanced glycation end products. These are number one, inflammatory unto themselves. Uh, they activate the receptors that are more inflammation. And then on top of that, they stick to long lived tissues, uh, especially collagen because of the protein uh, makeup, especially the specific amino acids. Um, and it just destroys your collagen. And this is why your skin droops, or one of the reasons that your skin droops. Um, it's also why you can get congestive heart failure without coronary disease, because your collagen over time just dissolves because of AGEs. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? If you're looking to use peptides, make sure you go to my number one source, Limitless Life Nootropics. For healing with BPC-157 and TB-500 or fat loss with ipamorelin, CGC-1295 and AOD-9604 to immunity with TA-1, thymus and alpha-1, Limitless Labs, a huge selection. Go to LimitlessLifeNootropics.com and use my code J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I send you guys tremendous love and light. Okay, so we have a couple different, a couple more uh, talking points relative to now that we uh, pushed all those. Did, did you really speak about, um, well, let's just talk about developing a longevity protocol. I mean, you kind of already said it. I mean, we've been back and forth, but for someone that understands all seven of those steps, does it really just depend on like your age? Like you were saying, like how aggressive you want to be, uh, where you are in your life. How, yeah, I mean, how would you it start? So it's, that's exactly right. And so, um, it's an algorithm essentially. So all of the agents that I have looked at, of which there are now 48, come with rating numbers, right? And the idea is you want a cross section to make sure that you are taking care of all of the reasons that you age. So it would not be unusual for a beginner to have three to five points in every category. And that's a balanced approach, right? The older you get or the more aggressive you want to get, you want more points in each category. So you sort of pile them on. Then if you have any concomitant medical problems, you focus on the area that that disease is sort of a problem. So for example, if you are diabetic, clearly glucose is a problem, right? So your waste management is gonna be a problem. So you wanna maximize all the points in that category. So you don't even have to know what these things do. You just need to know that you, you've got glycation issues and that's what you're gonna focus on. Mm. If you have a family history of cancer, maybe you wanna focus on DNA repair mechanisms right? If you are a massive athlete, maybe free radical scavenging is, is going to be a problem, right? The other big one is, is people call me all the time about just systemic uh, inflammatory issues. Well, you pick everything that has a lot of points in category five, right? Right. right. But the idea is you need to be well-rounded in all of them right. and accelerated in the ones that are important to you as a person. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, everything is, it all comes back to balance. You know, you have to have some balance. I mean, of all seven, there's probably going to be weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses in each one, but it's determining like where you are, your age and what your goals are as far as from a peak performance standpoint, and then assessing and coming up with the game plan. All right, by the way, do you offer, because I know you have a full-time uh, anesthesiologist job, do you offer like consulting or uh, coaching and helping people put these together? I do, I do. So if people... So funny, I do a podcast and then I get blitzkrieg with emails. Um, so if people have like a question, simple questions, I'm happy to answer their emails. Um, if someone wants a full consult, they want me yeah. to go through their history, look at their labs, blah, right. blah, 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 blah. Then I charge a fee because it just takes a bit of time. Of course. But yeah, I do it. Absolutely, I do. Um, and I do I do like to warn people, um, it is me, myself, and I doing all of this. Right. I don't have a secretary. I don't have an organizer. I have nothing. So, so, by the way, I have to ask you because you are. This is a fascinating podcast, and you do have an amazing mind on all of this stuff. I mean, is this what you passionately would prefer to do outside of being the chief anesthesiologist? I mean, is that like a conversation that you have con contemplated, or what? Oh my god, I think about it every day. Oh yeah. Okay, so what is stopping you? Um, many things. You need help on the internet marketing side. <laughs> Um, I, I like what I do and also it's like, you know, as an anesthesiologist, I get to take care of people. Um, well, if you, know, you like that, then who cares? But I, I mean, know, like, I, if I you want to do this, but, but, this is, but this is truly a passion, right? On the yeah. other hand, how do you make money doing this? And the answer is you have to see more patients. Do yeah. I really want to do that? I see enough patients. Do I really want to deal with podcasting and producing and yeah. making supplements and all that? 
I don't know. There's so many supplements out there. You sort of like pick and choose. And it does become sort of like a treasure hunt, like who makes good ones and who doesn't, right? So I think ultimately I will do that. But at the moment, it's kind of fun to do both. And That's it's, cool. and, you know, it's also financial, right? Yeah. You have to make enough money in one to switch over from the other. You're yeah. smart that you have that awareness because yeah, there's not like a fortune in podcasting and doing all this. But for someone like you, you could easily make a fortune in the supplement side. I mean, and I can assure yeah. you that you would make a lot more money than you're making even now, which I know you make a lot because I think anesthesiologists are paid the most of any doctors. I mean, look, I know supplement guys that are making 10 million a month. Yeah. And, and I know? think that's fantastic. I just, I also don't want to be the person that, you know, says, okay, read my book, listen to what I say. Now buy what I'm telling you to buy. Because but you're not you, that person though. You I would know, never be that a person. certain amount of, I don't know, credibility, right? No, but you're well, not at that person. Point, I probably Sandy, will. You're not that person. I've been listening to you. I know who you are. You're very passionate about what you know. Well, all right. So how about you and I make these things together? That may just make my life. I mean, we could definitely have a conversation. I mean, I'm down the road in all of this stuff, but um, but that we need more people in the space that have your your mind, but you know, also you know, want to help as many people as possible. Because I, you know, there's I won't mention names, but there's a lot of people out there that you know, have the reputation that they're helping people with all this stuff. And they really don't know, like, especially at the level that, you know, you know, and, I mean, I honestly, like, I can't believe that I haven't read your book. I mean, I mean, I've had people tell me about you and your book in the last year and a half. And, you know, everybody's going through COVID world and all the bullshit that we've been going through and transitioning our businesses and all that stuff. But uh, I'm very excited to read your book because I really want to get into the weeds with it. Um, but I think the last the last bullet point that I have from you is uh, measuring progress. So maybe a little bit on that, and then uh, we'll let uh, you know I'll promote where people can find you and how they can buy the book and all that. Sure. So what I have found is testing is really individualized, um, and there's also kind of a lot of bullshit out there because everyone says their test is the end all be all to measure physiologic length, right? There's cr chronological age versus physiologic age, right? I would argue because you age in seven tenants that you are going to need to measure all seven tenants. And at the moment you can measure some of it, but not all of it. Right. So in the so DNA, how much are they measuring? Woohoo! Yay. Uh, I forget which one that is, but you can, you can measure your telomere length. You can do epigenetics. Yeah. Like I think that BioViva has the best um, epigenetic clock right now. Um, you can do the whole glycation thing. Yep. You can, some people have the interleukin panels and the sirtuin panels, but that's pretty hard to get. Um, and then other people so go off on other angles, right? You can measure your microbiota because because you know that that's another piece of the puzzle. Um, there, there's there's just many 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 ways to measure this. I'm not completely convinced that any one of them is the end all be all. So it's going to be some sort of combination thing. In so why end. don't you develop a test? You're killing me. You you want you dying to have me make money. Um, and I appreciate but that. See, you you actually don't, and this is what's so cool. You're like me. You don't give a shit about making money. Like you truly care about helping people, which is why I'm telling you, like you could do all these things. And obviously you're passionate about helping children, which is the greatest gift. I mean, what, what can be better than that? You know what? So as an anesthesiologist, I don't really care if an old 90 year old guy who smoked a million packs. Of <laughs> I don't really care if he, you know, and that's terrible to say, but like he did it to but us. But it's right? true. It's true. That's actually the evolutionary uh, scientist in you too. You're like, right? hey man, you didn't, you abused your DNA, bro. It's time to go. Yeah, right. I mean, actually, from an environment, from an evolutionary point of view, if you've screwed up after you've reproduced, it doesn't really yeah. matter because your genes have been passed on. Exactly. I mean, that, right. <coughs> exactly. But, but kids, kids are innocent. They haven't done anything. They're not, you know, smoking. Well, some of them are smoking weed, but. For the most part, whatever they have, they didn't do to themselves. They're like sort of innocent. In By the way, what is a kid cut off to age for a kid, for an anesthesiologist to work with kids? Is it 12? 18. It 18. Oh, 18. Yeah. But the funny part about that is we get these 400 pound football athlete guys. And we're like, really? You have a beard and tattoos and you're a kid. Yeah. Right. And then I have to give them like, you know, slushies in the recovery room and the little doggy comes to visit. And it's really silly. So I think it should be weight based, but they seem to think that it's age based. I mean, honestly, I don't even like, I don't know how to determine like what a kid is. I mean, some of these younger kids now are such advanced souls or older souls, you know, the way they speak and stuff. Like I'm sure, 
I'm sure your daughter, your daughter's like that too. I know we were talking off air and stuff like that. Well, doc, this has been an amazing podcast. Like I said, I can't wait to read your book. Um, let me push up here, uh, how people can work with you and stuff and find you. Um, don't send her an email asking her questions for all the amazing information that she gave on today's show. When do you think in truth, your next book will be available? Do you think it'll be in within the next year? Oh my God. Yes. Okay. Um, this it'll year be anywhere sure. between a month to three months. Oh, awesome. It was supposed to be out for Christmas. And then there was this formatting disaster. You know, <laughs> who's your publisher? So it's actually a good question. Um, I have it fielded out to a couple different ones. They're looking at it. Uh, if they, I just, I, I'm afraid that they're going to take away uh, my ridiculousness in this book because. I'm not here to write a bestseller, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. If, if I were great, this is never going to be a bestseller. And if this is what they want me to do, then I'll just self-publish again. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I mean, as as first, we'll see, but three months at the latest. Look, I've published six books. I've used two big time publishers, absolutely worthless. I would self-publish every single time now, you know, with a good self-publishing independent house. Uh, the publishers all get in the way. They I really mean, do. literally just get in the way. They literally will get in the way, no matter what you do. You know, if that's your issue, it's like, I don't want them to remove, you know, my humor and, you know, my little nuanced things, then like definitely self-publish because they will, you know, and yeah, then they yeah, drive you crazy. Give them a chance. And when they decide to screw with it, I'd be like, mm, yeah, no, because the, the style of my book and you haven't read it yet is, is a little bit unusual. It's um, it vacillates between the utterly ridiculous bad jokes and the hardest course science you'll ever read. Right. And 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 it's just extremely variable. And the reason I do that, is because I want people to be able to understand it at some level, regardless of who they are. Right. And the publisher usually says like, who's your target audience? And the answer is whoever the hell wants to read it. Right. That is my target right. audience. Well, I always tell you that here's the thing though, too, though. Uh, the, the data now is that the average reading level is fourth grade. Yeah, okay. they're not going to like this. This is this is like this is a college level book. Yeah, well, I mean, they don't expect anyone to read it. No, and I and I don't. That being said, it is sort of book one became the encyclopedia of longevity. Right. And Bill Andrew, it's it's I don't know if you know who he is. He's like the king of telomeres. He's a genius, and it sits on his um on his living room table. That's all. Awesome. So whoever comes over picks it up, and they're like, oh my god. And because of that book on that living room table, I've now been in documentaries and bizarre That's talk awesome. shows and because it's scientifically accurate, there's no bullshit in it. Well, That's so awesome. I can't wait to read the book. Why didn't you make it 333 pages? It's 332. I ran out of things to say. Spiritual, <laughs> just, see, if I, I, I would have been, 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 been consulting you, if I would have been consulting you before I met you, I'd have been like, Sandy, you just got to put a picture. It's three. So, so that's actually really, really friggin' funny. I was given so much hassle about that. So my picture's on the back and I didn't put it on the front for a reason. Um, I called it the Kaufman protocol and I got such fucking, pardon my language, hassle for that because they're like, well, that's rather selfish of you. I'm like, well, I don't <laughs> what else are you going to call it? There it is. Right. But the other thing is that people will call me and say, oh, good. You're a Jewish doctor. Then you must be right. <laughs> Right. They think that I'm a man Jewish doctor. And I'm like, OK, be my guest. Believe it. I, You know, turns I'm not an atheist. I'm not Jewish, nor am I a man. And but you would never know that by looking at the cover. But you do tell them you're Jewish, right? I am a little Jewish. I'm a little atheist. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. But they did talk me into putting it on. So I will be on the front of the second book because now cat's out of the bag. I'm a, not a man. I'm not Jewish. This is me. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's awesome. So that was my idea of marketing. There it is. Beautiful. All right. Well, I'm your book is coming. Uh, I will definitely reach out to you. By the way, what is your cell phone number? Three zero five. Oh God, is everyone gonna call me now? Oh, yeah, Three zero five. No, 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 don't put it out. I forgot. So that was my <laughs> brain fart, but you are amazing. Um, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. I know I was all over the place, but there was a lot of really good information that you dropped in here. I mean, there were some serious nuggets. I know that. A lot of people are going to ask me for me to translate to, to uh, transcribe this podcast, which I probably will. But uh, if people want to buy the book, it's actually it's at the Kaufman protocol.com. You're found on Instagram at Kaufman anti aging. You get the final thoughts. Um, oh, gosh, I think I'm out of thoughts. I just encourage people to understand that longevity is real. 
Yep. Uh, it's not crazy. We can't actually, you know, we can be positive, help ourselves without being absolutely crazy and neurotic. How about so that? bonus question around that. If someone does all of the things, controls for all the factors that you write in your seven steps, how, how long of a physical age is it reasonable to assume you can live to? Uh, I think that it depends on when you start the protocol. Okay. Uh, optimally, I would say 120, 130. That's awesome. And, and, and as you said earlier in the show, between 120 and 130, um, in absolutely amazing strength, functional ability, right? You can pick up your grandkids or your great grandkids at that age and still climb and, and, and partake in specific like vigorous activities in life. Correct. Yep. And the only other thing I would warn people is like, don't retire at 60 because right. you've got like an entire second half of your life to live. hundred percent. hundred percent. I mean, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, even I always, I, you know, I always battle with this with people and friends of mine, you know, who are very well to do. I'm like, but what are you going to do? Cause when the mind stops, you know, becoming active without things to do, you know, it, it's very easy to draw withdraw you know, into a, a depressive or a recessive state, and then you don't have purpose. And when you don't have oh purpose. God. Speaking of well-to-do people that you know, so here's the most ridiculous goal that I came up with a year ago, and you can help me with this. Here's my my last statement. Someone asked me, um, if, if what would be the grand finale of my existence as a longevity expert? That's and I decided question. that if I could fix Brad Pitt, <laughs> <I'd be it. laughs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> By the way, Brad Pitt, what is he like? 54, 55? Uh, I don't actually know. I mean, I'm 53. He looks like shit. And someone uh, has got to just tell him that he looks hold on, like let me, shit. A Brad Pitt age. He is, uh, why is it not telling me how old he is? Oh, geez, he's way older. He is 58 years old. Oh, he's only got me by five years. He looks like garbage. Someone's oh, got to fix him. And this is my like, thing to do in life now so you just call him up and tell him well remember in hollywood they use all sorts of agents <laughs> <laughs> to maintain their youthful appeal supposedly it's not allegedly <clears throat> dr sandy i appreciate you coming <laughs> on today i definitely have fun. not been my best i have not been my best self today but i got through it and i think that like i said I know I was all over the place and asking you breaking things up, but you dropped a lot of bombs uh, of wisdom and uh, you know, people will definitely be uh, searching for more. So again, I'm very grateful that you came on here today. So guys support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast, please visit her website. It's Kaufman K A U F M A N. And by the way, N N protocol.com. Her Instagram uh, is Kaufman anti-aging. Uh, and she is obviously an incredibly bright and engaging young woman. And I'm grateful that she came on here to the Jay Campbell podcast, even though I'm not at my best. Just everybody remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. I will see all of you guys very soon.